The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Oh, there's plenty of sports to get to today. Mike Loxley held his news conference yesterday with the Maryland football season going down the tubes. Can they save it? Can they win one of their last three games and get bowl eligible? We'll see. We'll get to his comments. Um, Deion Sanders with a very good interview on the Dan Patrick show yesterday. I'm going to play some highlights of that. Uh, Also, this was the day in 1970 that Tom Dempsey had an historic kick. It's a field goal record that has since been broken and was broken two years ago by Justin Tucker, who topped it by three yards. But when Tom Dempsey, on this day in 1970, kicked a 63-yard field goal, Everybody said, what? Are you kidding me? And, you know, there's there's more to it than that. Uh, if you're not familiar with Tom Dempsey, he was born without toes on his right foot, his kicking foot, and also fingers on his right hand. Not that that uh, factored into it, but uh, he had a kicking shoe, which has since been outlawed. And on top of that, the goalposts in those days were up against the goal line. So he kicked this field goal from his own 37-yard line. Just unbelievable. We'll, we'll go back on that and, and a whole lot more. I, I just want to throw this in about the weather as we look at another beautiful day coming up. It's supposed to be in the low 60s. Tomorrow's supposed to be in the upper 70s. Upper 70s into November. Amazing. Uh, but I did hear Doug Camera of Channel 4 with his long-range forecast on my buddy Kevin Sheehan show yesterday and uh, he gave great detail about the snowy winter that he expects here he's been pretty mild for the last you know couple of years anyway um and he you know puffed his chest out saying yeah i I told you it wasn't going to be a brutally hot summer and it wasn't so i'm telling you it's going to be a very snowy winter and here's what got me he compared it to the winter of 1965 to 1966 now if you're old enough to remember that and and i am that is, to me, the most incredible snow we've had. Now, I you know, did go out to my driveway in 2016, I believe, January 2016, and put the tape measure in the ground, and it was 31 inches. But this was an actual blizzard, and the wind gusts were unbelievable, and the drifts, and I was probably I was seven years old, so I was at least four feet tall, the drifts were over my head. Uh, that's what I remember the most. We were out of school for an entire week, And that was an incredible snowstorm that um, my sister almost was born in our home. My father got my mother to the hospital just in time, got her to Holy Cross Hospital. And uh, and she delivered the baby there before the the snow really built into a blizzard. But it was so bad uh, that uh, they were helicoptering nurses into the hospital. They couldn't even get them there by car. And the hospital had one visitor, and I told this at my father's funeral back in in uh, April, that the one visitor was my dad who drove his Plymouth Fury through this brutal snowstorm to get to Holy Cross to visit my mother. You know, that storm hath no fury like Al Poland driving his 1963 Plymouth Fury through the blizzard of 1966. So, uh, got your fingers crossed. I hope I do. Uh, hopefully, camera is wrong on this. But if we're going to have another one like that, oh boy, uh, buckle up, buckle up for that. Carson Wentz is back. Carson Wentz signing a contract, well, pending a physical, but signing a contract with the Rams yesterday as they have had an injury to Matthew Stafford. He missed last week's game against Green Bay with a sprained thumb ligament. They have uh, cut a couple of quarterbacks, including Brett Rippon, who was just terrible in that game. And so they need somebody who can step in and play. Now, Wentz has to pass a physical, uh, so uh, they've got time because uh, the Rams are on a bye week this week. And I guess it's it's possible that Stafford gets back in time for the, for the following game, but it's possible that, that Wentz will have to start for them. And it's, it's an amazing decline of his career because in 2017, he was mentioned as an MVP candidate before he hurt his knee. And then Nick Foles stepped in and won the Super Bowl. 2018, he really wasn't too bad. Uh, he was okay. 2019, he lost his job, gets traded to the Colts, 
and the Colts look at him, and they don't they don't like it that he blows a game at the end of the season, just terrible against a bad Jacksonville team, knocking him out of the playoffs, and winds up in Washington last year as as Dan Snyder said, we got ourselves a quarterback. Well, they didn't, and he was. Terrible in his one last chance when he got to start against the Browns with the season on the line and stunk, absolutely stunk, was benched for the last game of the season against the Cowboys and cut in February, and he's been out of football all that time. You know, here we are in November, and that's what, 10 months later, that uh, nine months later, that he, he has been out of work, finally landing a job with the Rams. Uh, what does this mean is this significant? No, probably not. Brian Baldinger, NFL Network, on with Andrew Siciliano, who was sitting in for Rich Eisen yesterday, and this was his take on Wentz winding up with the Rams, his fourth team in four years. There's so many ironies that hit me. Um, 2016, the Rams trade up, get the number one pick. They take Goff over Carson Wentz. Eagles trade up twice to get to the number two pick. There was a lot of close to the vest conversations, who was going one, Wentz or Goff, Goff. And Carson Wentz is going to see Jared Goff this week as the Lions come to Los Angeles. Chris, uh, Carson Wentz got hurt in 2017 on his way to an MVP season at the Coliseum against the Rams. And I'm sure Sean McVay is saying, well, we brought Baker Mayfield in last year. He was the first-round pick. He won a game for us. Like, maybe I can – reconstitute Carson Wentz to 2017 form. Maybe he's not all the way broken. Maybe there's something of a reclamation project here. I I just have to catch my breath. <laughs> you're, so you're let, let, me, stunned. I let, love it. let me step back for a second. So Matthew Stafford didn't play this past Sunday. The Rams were awful. There's no other way to yes. say it. Offensively with Brent Rippon. They, they were just bad. Right. They they just needed one or two plays in Green Bay. They didn't get them, and they lost. the The sentiment from Sean McVay yesterday on the podium, and then on his coach's show, which he does every Monday night with the voice of the Rams, good friend JB Long and good friend Demarco Farr, was very positive. Rams are in a buy this week. Very positive that Matthew could come back next week after the buy. Now nothing set in stone, but that yeah. We kind of feel good about it. This this leads me to ask, has there been a setback? Have they reevaluated Matthew's thumb and went, nah, maybe he needs surgery now? Did something happen? Because if you think Stafford's going to be okay, you don't necessarily need Carson Wentz. Or maybe you say, the heck with it, the heck with it. We think we could put together a wild card run here. And we're not comfortable now that we've seen Brett Rippon in Green Bay. We need a legitimate backup. I don't know. Well, I think you need a legitimate backup. You know, we saw backups last week, Cleet and Toon. And we saw support performances around the league from backup quarterbacks. Um, but, you know, they're not New York Giants. Like, what are they? Like, he's got to be better than Tommy DeVito. You know, I mean, just look at the backups that are playing. But I just believe philosophically, Andrew, in collecting quarterbacks. Like, like sometimes... Look, when the Eagles drafted Jalen Hurts, nobody knew how it was going to rankle Carson Wentz the way it did. And things went south in a hurry. Uh, but things didn't work out in Indianapolis or Washington for it either. But it's not like he's not a talented player. I've had general managers that drafted him in the personnel department of Philadelphia say that he was a human cyborg. Like physically, you just don't see people like that. I think fundamentally he's very poor and needs a lot of work. But – I don't see any harm in bringing him in. Matt Stafford's not going to be threatened by Carson no. Wentz. He just not at this stage in his, his career. But why not just take a look and see what's there? And you know, maybe he is. Maybe he can't digest a playbook, or he can't play with proper fundamentals. And you've got nothing to lose at this point. Yeah, Sean McVay. Why not? You know, he's he's developed quarterbacks before. He had great success here when he worked with. Uh, uh, Kirk Cousins, and he's uh, developed, you know, he didn't develop Stafford, but he, he took Stafford to another level, a Super Bowl champion. Um, and, you know, Jared Goff, he got him to a Super Bowl. Now he soured on him and, and sent him to Detroit. But, you know, maybe he can resuscitate him to some degree. And, and Baldinger's right. Look at the quarterbacks who are playing right now. The, these no-names, these guys who are street-free agents coming in and playing and 
playing at a decent level. Maybe there's something left with Carson Wentz, though. There didn't look to be much when he played here last year. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's going to be one to, to keep an eye on. The, uh, the college basketball season is, is off and rolling. Uh, Georgetown opened with LeMoyne, which uh, I believe is a Division I team. But, you know, come on, that's, that's kind of the cupcakes that you play in the early part of the season. They blew them off the floor. So Ed Cooley, who's the new coach and has to turn things around, um, Okay, good. Start with a blowout. The Maryland team started out with a, an opponent that they should beat and did. They beat Mount St. Mary's by 15 points, 68-53 last night. But here's, here's the intriguing thing for me, having followed Maryland basketball now for over 50 years. They have a new guard who was the All-Met Player of the Year at Paul VI last year. Uh, his name is uh, Deshaun Harris-Smith. He's 6'5" and led Paul VI to an undefeated season, winning in the uh, Catholic League. And uh, he made his debut last night. Now, I, I know it's it's not the kind of competition that they're going to be playing in the Big Ten, but to be playing Mount St. Mary's in your first college game ever and to play as well as he did, he scored 12 points, four of six shooting. He played both point guard and also uh, off the ball and, and you know, did, did a good job last night to the point where – you know, Kevin Willard is is saying that that he might be the best freshman guard he has ever had, and it got me thinking uh, about Maryland guards that they've had over the years, and there've been some great ones. Some have gone on to the NBA and and had you know really great NBA careers, like Steve Blake, who was I believe a second round pick, but uh, he came in right away and started as a freshman. But that was a really good team. I mean that that team had a lot of really good players on it, and uh, as a junior. He led them to the national championship as a sophomore. He took them to the final four. He had a tremendous career. That might be a comp here. Might be. Uh, We'll have to see, and it's way early to say that. Uh, Some of the other guards, it took a while to develop. Uh, Steve Francis was not actually a freshman. He was only at Maryland for one year, and had spent some time at two different junior colleges. And then Juan Dixon, who became a superstar for Maryland, he, he redshirted his first year and didn't play much as a redshirt freshman. He really didn't start to come on until his sophomore year, and then by his junior year, he was a star. The comp here may be, and I may be going a little bit too far, but the comp may be John Lucas. John Lucas, who came to Maryland as a freshman in 1972, he is the only athlete, I believe, in in history to be an All-American in tennis and in basketball. He was just a tremendous athlete and stepped into a team that was ready to win. I mean, he, he was a freshman on a team that had Tom McMillan and Len Elmore as juniors. That's the only year that they made it to the NCAA tournament with Lefty Drizel. The following year, of course, was the the famous overtime loss to NC State in the ACC final, which totally changed the the NCAA tournament. But uh, the point I would make about John Lucas is he came ready. You know, you, 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 pulled him out of the box, and he was ready to go. He, he started right away as a freshman on a veteran team. I mean, they had Howard White, who was coming back as a point guard. He had a bad knee. But they had veteran guys across the board, except for this freshman who had more poise than anybody else. And I'm not saying that Deshaun Harris-Smith is going to wind up with a career like John Lucas, who would have been a Hall of Famer had he not had, had the drug issues. Even still, he had a tremendous NBA career. Number one, number one pick of the draft. But if, if this guy turns out to be in that level, then you're really looking at something very encouraging there. That's, that's something that, that really could, could vault Maryland basketball into, uh, into a stratosphere that they haven't been in a long, long time. They, uh, you know, the last really great team that they had was, of course, the national championship team of 2002, a very good team, the one with Gravis Vasquez in 2010, which lost that crazy buzzer beater game to Michigan State they may have had final four potential but you're talking over a decade here and I, I Maryland is not ranked you know and who knows where they'll be two months from now but I really like what Kevin Willard is doing and when you keep a superstar player at home as he was able to do that's a big part of it because this area is absolutely loaded with high school talent and when you could take the All-Met Player of the Year at a high-level program like Paul the Sixth and plug him into your program, which already has veterans, and and the you know the landscape has changed with the NIL and with the transfer portal, you could you can reshape your team in a matter of a, a couple of weeks in the off-season. It's a totally different deal. But 
you know, if you're getting nostalgic like me and, and thinking about the great freshmen who have come in here, um, they haven't necessarily been guards. Uh, Lucas uh, Blake, although not a superstar, outstanding player. Um, you know, the ones who have, have gone on to great careers at Maryland kind of developed over time. Now, there were, there were superstars who stepped in as freshmen right away. Joe Smith was, was unbelievable when he came to Maryland in 1994. Um, and then, you know, when you didn't have freshman eligibility, uh, you had Tom McMillan, who was the player of the year. He's on the cover of Sports Illustrated, but he had to play on the freshman team. Uh, but when he emerged as a sophomore, he became a superstar. So uh, keep your eye on Deshaun Harris-Smith, but this is always a fun part of the college basketball season, looking at the new toys as they, uh, as they unwrap all the new ones, and, uh, and everybody's all excited about that. Um, one thing on uh, on the Caps, they're playing tonight at home against Florida, getting off to kind of a slow start. And Alex Ovechkin, I think, has two goals on the season, so he still needs 71 to get past Gretzky. And, uh, you know, not that it's any time to panic and he's healthy, but um, he's going to go, looks like, the rest of the way without Nick Backstrom. And uh, talking to reporters yesterday, Ovechkin said, I was in shock. He's my friend, he's my teammate, and to see how emotional it is, it's a tough situation. Me and him played together since day one, and it's kind of hard now to see what's happening. And uh, you heard Brian McClellan, the general manager of the team, say he expects that uh, you won't see Backstrom for the rest of the year, and it sounds more and more like his career is over. He's not going to throw in the towel yet, but he's about to turn 36 years old, and it looks like Ovechkin is going to have to take it the rest of the way without his longtime teammate and line mate. Guys have been together since 2007. Wow, they played over 1,000 games together as Washington Capitals. Uh, so, anyway, they're, they're playing tonight. The Wizards, by the way, and uh, <laughs> Wizards are, are, have a home and home with Charlotte. Charlotte is a bad defensive team. The numbers for the Wizards are overwhelmingly bad. They have given up close to 129 points a game. That's last in the league. As a comparison, Minnesota leading the league in defense, they've given up just over 101. So the Wizards are giving up essentially a quarter's worth of points per game than Minnesota. <laughs> 28 points a game worse than the number one team in the league. Every year, you, oh, yeah, defense, defense. And, and they're bringing in Wes Unsell Jr. because he's known for defense. He really helped Denver. Well, Denver had better players, and the Wizards don't have players that are interested in defense whatsoever. And you see it where they just <laughs> – the other night where they played Philadelphia, where they gave up 146 points, and Joel Embiid had uh, 48 and sat out the fourth quarter, 30 minutes, and he had 29 points in the third quarter, didn't miss a shot. <laughs> Man, that's <laughs> some defense. All right, uh, coming up, the Jets are a mess. You knew that. But – Here's how big a mess they are. It's left their coach tongue-tied. You'll hear that next. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Well, we got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock today. Uh, I want to delve into the stinkitude of the New York Jets. But first, this. Aaron Rodgers, who was caught on camera after the ugly loss to the Chargers the other night, uh, hugging it out with... Um, with Derwin James, they have the same agent. I guess, I don't know if they were teammates or not, but they have the same agent, so they know each other. And uh, and James said, you know, when are you coming back? And he said, uh, give it a few weeks. And so that leads to back. Oh, a few weeks, so they game 12. Well, Rodgers made his regular appearance on the Pat McAfee show yesterday and was asked about that and said, no, it, it'll be a few fortnights. Well, do you know what a fortnight is? A fortnight is two weeks. That would mean... He could be back in six weeks. You know what happens in six weeks? The Jets host the Washington Commanders. That is Christmas Eve, December 24th. Now, okay, um, that doesn't mean it's going to happen because he flippantly threw out a few fortnights. Probably not. Uh, and said to McAfee, we're still a little ways off. I've got to hit markers. I've got to get on the practice field. Then they have to open up the window for me to come back from it. So there's a lot that has to happen. I'm not saying it can't get accelerated, but there's still a lot of things I have to do before we can even talk about getting on the field. He says he's entering the danger zone of recovery, the 8- to 12-week period, which he's in now. So it's been two months, a little over two months since he uh, – about two months, I guess, since he uh, tore his 
Achilles tendon. And uh, he says if he pushes too hard, he could risk a setback. But uh, he has been walking without crutches for over a month, not jogging yet. Uh, the Jets are four and four. Uh, four and four in the AFC is a lot worse than four and four in the NFC. Uh, so Rodgers also says, well, by the time I get back, we got to meet in the mix. Uh, so he's not coming back for a team that's not going to make the playoffs. He says, but more than that, I've got to be able to be healthy, to be able to move, to be able to protect myself, to have strength in all the throws. Now, he was launching 50 yarders before the game the other night, but that's, you know, big difference between throwing passes uh, with nobody rushing you and and with uh, some of the fastest and strongest men in the world trying to chase you down. It's uh, it's quite different, so he's going to have to uh, do that. As for the game, the game on Monday night was horrendous. Uh, the Chargers beat the Jets 27-6. to Jets were 3-for-17 on third downs. That's just god-awful. Now, the numbers for Zach Wilson don't look incredibly bad. He was 33-49. of 49 for 263 yards. But the Jets offensively were punchless in this game. Um, they, they, they were no match for the Chargers, who, you know, haven't been that great this year. The Chargers, with the win, they're also 4-4, four and four, uh, and that have, have not beaten a good team. So you know, let's not get too, too worked up about that. But um, here's how bad it was, because you don't usually hear Troy Aikman this critical – but if you missed this the other day, we, or yesterday, we ran this from, uh, from Monday night, where Troy Aikman always appears with Joe Buck, with Scott Van Pelt after the game, and they got around to the Jets' offense, and boy, this is, this is Aikman unloading. Troy, this, this Jets' offense is so limited, and you know they, they carried a winning record in, and you look at it, and you try to figure out how the heck they did it, but they're not pulling a rabbit out of their hat tonight, and given what they've got and what they don't, what do they do from here? Oh, man. I mean, how much time do you have? We, we, we'll be here <laughs> Not a, a while. lot, Troy. I mean, and I know you want to go. I, not a lot. I mean, <laughs> and the Jets don't have a lot of time either. Yeah. You know, they're running out of games in order to get this turned around. It's been like this all year long. I mean, for a league where it's built around offense, they've scored two touchdowns in a game one time. And and that was against Kansas City. The rest of them, they scored one. They struggled again tonight. You know, you talk about the Chargers anyway and what they're trying to do sure. on their side of the ball. They got Detroit this next week so they're going to find out about them defensively as to whether or not they're for real but the Jets I'm, I don't know if they're a good football team I mean it's hard to look at them tonight and say that they're good they're great on defense and yep. I thought the defense was terrific again tonight but is that a good football team that we watched tonight no I don't think so I think they're a bad team with a great defense is what I think they are and I don't know that they were a playoff team coming in I didn't see anything tonight that suggests they're a playoff team they haven't beat a good football team and so, uh, you know, where they – or, excuse me, the Jets haven't beat a good football team. Or excuse, the, the Chargers yeah, haven't right, beat right, a good right. football team overall. <laughs> but the Jets, you know, I, I know they had the win against Philadelphia, and that was nice. But overall, I just I, – I don't think this is a very good football team. And they've got a long way to go if they're going to make it into the postseason, which I don't expect them to do. No, and in, if, if they are in postseason position, when you get to December 24th, then you got a real decision – on Aaron Rodgers, if by some miracle he's ready to go. I, I still don't see it, and I think he always, Rodgers likes to bask in the attention of it. I think he knew the cameras were nearby when he said the other night that he could be back in a few weeks, and then, you know, when he appears on the Pat McAfee show, that gets all kinds of attention, so, you know, dropping the, the Fortnite thing, very, very flip about that. So, yeah, don't, don't get too uh, worked up about that. Meantime, though, uh, Robert Sala making his weekly appearance on the Michael K show on ESPN radio in New York, Sala coach of the jets. And, um, you know, it, it would seem that he would be better prepared for the questions that were coming, but it's, it's not so much what he says, it's how he says it. And this was K asking the question that every jet fan wants to know, having seen, eight games so far of Zach Wilson and seeing what they saw in the Monday night debacle against the Chargers. I, I personally don't think Zach can play at this level for a team that has a defense like this. And you just said a couple of questions ago, our offense has been troubling for three years. Well, I mean, that's the one constant. Why are you guys so dead set on sticking with Zach Wilson when he has not been able to do it? What are you seeing that a neophyte like me is not seeing, Coach? I don't get it. No, that's a fair question, um, a very fair question. But, you know, I 
it's easy it's easy you know the the three the three people who get drilled in losses as the quarterback the play caller and the head coach that's natural territory um it's our job to go back and look at the tape and and to figure out the actual reasons why the all 22 that that says everything and that's why i think you see some analysts turn on the tape and and like well geez the kid really didn't play that bad you know and it's uh and you turn on the tape and are there things that zach needed to do better yesterday a hundred percent he knows it we know it every, everyone knows it but are there areas of the field where we could have been better for him as a play caller sure are there areas on the field where we could have been better as position coaches putting our players in position yes uh could the players have been better from an execution standpoint catching the ball um blocking running the right routes um being more efficient in the run game absolutely so it's if if this was and and sometimes it's very obvious when you turn on the all 22 that the quarterback is just incapable but that it's not the case here you know and uh um you know it's there are there are hundred there are so many things that everybody needs to get better at, including the quarterback. Um, and I think that's you know it's it's what you know. I don't know. Hopefully, I'm answering your question, right. but it's it's just it's it's not always as easy as like I said the the, the three heads that get rocked the most in the losses, starting with me, um, then the play caller, then the quarterback. It's just that's all natural. All right. So that's that's all. Kind of stumbling through it. This is the one, though, where you go, woo, <laughs> that's not good. Uh, this was a question later, uh, also asked by Michael Kay. You've got Trevor Simeon uh, in your building. Why Why not give him a try? No, I got you. No, it's, uh, again, a fair question. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, like I said, he, he, I don't know. You got me. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna plead the fifth on all this one in terms of just. Uh, I've, I kind of explained it, you know, yeah. uh, respectfully, obviously, but mm-hmm. but it's a va- they're valid questions. But and I know, and I know from the, from a passionate fan, from from fans who are passionate, all having the same questions, I respect it greatly. Um, you know, but it's I, I've got to look at it from a global standpoint and uh, and just see where we are and uh, and look at the all twenty two the best I can and and make the decisions best as possible. Plead the fifth. Plead the fifth about a simple question about a backup quarterback. You couldn't dance around that. You couldn't say, no, we're still committed to Zach Wilson. I I don't think he can say it anymore because he doesn't believe it. Um, And I don't know what this is, whether this is an organizational decision, whether it's his decision, but you got to be prepared for that. And you got to say, nope, nope, we've seen enough. We've seen enough from Zach Wilson that we're going to stick with him. We're not going to Trevor Simeon. And, you know, he did he did uh, talk a little bit about the Rogers situation, but is you know, staying clear of that because he doesn't want to put further pressure on that situation. I mean, it's but plead the fifth. I don't think I've ever heard a coach say oh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> that's that's something Donald Trump does in court. Oh, I don't know. Um, that's that's not uh, that's weird. That's that's very, very weird. John Feist, has got a column today about the commanders. He doesn't usually write about the NFL, and uh, there are some points in here that I agree with and some that I don't. And the headline is, as commanders muddle along, a few more losses wouldn't hurt. This is what we get to most years with this team. Um, maybe not this early, but certainly by December, it's, oh, lose as many as you can to get a better draft pick. It's kind of what he's suggesting here. But he's also throwing out the possibility that Ron Rivera does well enough the rest of the season to keep his job. He's got one year left on his contract. I just don't see that happening. But Feinstein writes this. uh, What could make Josh Harris's job a little bit more difficult is if they continue to win. Firing Rivera is almost certain to be easily justifiable at a season's end unless – The team somehow slips into the playoffs, which is unlikely but not impossible in the paper-thin NFC, in which Washington sits one game out of a wild-card spot. Throw in Washington somehow pulling out a first-round win, and Harris could have a problem. I I, I don't see it. I don't see it even with a first-round win. I I think that that Ron Rivera represents the residue of Dan Snyder and— while in many ways he's done a good job clearing out, you know, some of the off the field mess that that he had to wade through, uh, his record is, is mediocre. You know, he, he what he's done here in the four years that he's been a head coach pretty much mirrors what he did in Carolina, with the exception of the 2015 season, 
when he got his team to the Super Bowl. And they were very, very good. And you had Cam Newton as the MVP of the league. There were a lot of things going your way. Other than that, no. And this is more from Feinstein in his column. He says, there is no doubt about Harris knowing he needs to a clean sweep of the building in Ashburn. Team president Jason Wright was put in charge of the name change that Snyder was dragged into coming up with. Commanders, arguably the most nondescript, meaningless team name in sports, with the possible exception of Wizards. Martin May, who has the title of general manager, but little apparent power because all final football decisions belong to Rivera. If Harris came through the building with a giant vacuum cleaner, that would be a good start. Agree with that 100%. And I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. I think everybody is gone from Jason Wright to Ron Rivera to Martin May you to all the people who are, are associated with uh, the team on and off the field. It, it's time for a clean sweep and start over. Now, here's where I vehemently disagree with John. He says you hang on to Eric Bieniemy and you look at his development with Sam Howell, the two of them together. And I think both of them have come a long way, especially the last two weeks. Play calling has been much better and Bienemy has admitted, you know, it's a work in progress for him as well as it is for Sam Howell. So, okay, what you see over the last eight games might convince you to keep Bienemy. But this is this is something that they cannot do. John Feinstein writes, Bienemy should be the coach and should have a role in selecting a general manager, one who has real authority and can bring in his own scouting staff because the current staff has failed consistently. No, 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 no. You hire a general manager. You get rid of this, whatever structure it is, with the two Martys and Rivera. You tell them, thank you very much, but we're moving along. And then you bring in a general manager. And you say to the general manager, look, uh, we like Eric Bieniemy, but this is going to be your decision. And if you decide to keep him, we're, we'll support you 100%. And there may be enough evidence to support keeping him if Sam Howell continues to develop and how talks to them and says, oh, yeah, EB and I, we're, we're on the same page. And, you know, everything he says publicly is that, but maybe behind the scenes it might be a little bit different. But if he's 100% behind Eric Bieniemy, okay, you keep him around, but only long enough for the general manager to say yes or no because it is not a good situation. It has never been a good situation when you, A, hire the coach first and then the general manager, or, B, give the head coach – both responsibilities, as we've seen with Rivera. Just doesn't work out. Didn't work out for, for Bill Parcells in New York with the Jets. They they got to the AFC Championship game, but as as the one who was shopping for the groceries as well as cooking the meal, as he put it, they couldn't get back to a Super Bowl. And the times that it's worked out in the history of the league, in modern times, not you know the 1960s where the coach made all the calls. I mean, even George Allen in the 1970s when he was team president – and coach and made all those trades and instantly improved the team and did get them to a Super Bowl, didn't win one, didn't win one. And I think if if you're looking at long term and they're, I, I'm sure, in for the long term and as Harris is, as evidence with the way he's won the Philadelphia 76ers, that he's willing to absorb the short term pain for the long term gain. You don't make that move. You don't say to Eric Bieniemy, help us hire a general manager. That's that that just does not work. You might look at others who come off the Andy Reid tree in, in Kansas City and say, okay, that's somebody we might consider as a general manager, someone who maybe has worked indirectly with, with the enemy in the past. But that's not the way to do it. Um, and I do agree with John that, you know, it, it, it makes it harder to get rid of Rivera as a coach if they win and if they even win a playoff game. But I, I think even still, if they go out in the first round of the playoffs – and they announced that Ron Rivera is gone. I don't think anybody's going to be upset about that. I, I can't imagine that anybody in the fan base is going to go, no, no, he's just hitting his stride. No, his his long-term record shows that he is a mediocre coach. He is, he's, as John says, um, he says he's, he's, he's not Jim Zorn in any stretch. Uh, he has coached in the Super Bowl, but he is not Coach Gibbs by any stretch either. That's right. And you keep looking until you find someone who is the coach Gibbs. And that could be, you know, somebody who's like Andy Reid now. Not that Andy Reid is going to leave Kansas City to come here, but that's what you got to look for. And I, I don't think there'd be any problem whatsoever if they do 
win enough to make the playoffs and even win a playoff game, I, I still think you, you make a move and, uh, and, and get somebody. And they will. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that somebody new will be running this team next year. Well, I may be bored and broke, which I'm not. And I am back for this hour after the previous hour, which show always starts to, at 9 o'clock. Um, but I'm also uh, kind of happy about this weather. Yeah, how about this? 63 degrees today. It's supposed to be upper 70s tomorrow. Amazing. So uh, I don't know if you heard yesterday at the end of the uh, 10 o'clock hour, I was with uh, talking to Rex Bintern about a, a variety of things, including my outrage over being asked for a tip for a milkshake that costs nearly $7 at uh, Five Guys. I had some uh, dental work done, couldn't eat solid food, so I stopped in to get a milkshake and understood what it cost. It's just like the chutzpah of asking a 20% tip on, on top of a milkshake that costs nearly $7. You're going to pay more than $8 for a milkshake, which you know is mind-blowing to someone like me who paid for plenty of them over the years at McDonald's going back to when they were $0.35. Cents. So <laughs> you know, it's just hard to get my head around that. So I was, I was fetching yesterday about that. Let me say today, I'm content about another consumer issue. This is very odd at my house. I don't know if it, it happened at yours, and, and maybe it was coincidental because it was daylight savings time. You know, they always tell you you should change the battery in your smoke alarm when you change the clock, which, frankly, I really haven't done, and I wait for it to beep, and I change the battery. But on Sunday, three smoke alarms, I have five in my house, three of them began to beep. And I went to one of them, and I you know, tried to change the battery, and that didn't do any good. It was still beeping, and the other two started beeping. And then it occurred to me, as I looked inside the, the smoke alarm, and it said, put in in 2013, that maybe these things now have a 10-year life. And there's an expiration. There's a timer that goes off after 10 years, and the thing doesn't work. So now I've got to get new smoke alarms. Well, the last time I had installed smoke alarms in my old house, this is going back at least 15 years, maybe close to 20, it was a different ball game. You had to wire in the alarms. The battery was the backup, but the smoke alarm was wired to the house. And if you had a power failure, then the battery would take over and, and do its job with the smoke alarm. And while I could do it, eh, you know, it's, I'm not an electrician, and I, I got a little bit of a shock on one of them, and I was a little hesitant to do it, but I thought, okay, well... Got to suck it up and, uh, and figure out a way to install new smoke alarms. So I go to Home Depot yesterday, bought three new smoke alarms, and I open up the package, and it looks like it's all self-contained. There are no wires sticking out like the old ones. And then I, I look closely at the instructions, and there are no wires. Wow. All I had to do was change the bracket to put it up, and it's a 10-year smoke alarm. There's no battery to change. Just... Put it up, you know, like the old Ron Popeil oven. Set it and forget it. You know, <laughs> I just put up the new smoke alarm. I thought, God, this is great. So I'm now a happy consumer, and I'm happy that I got three new smoke alarms. They only cost twenty dollars a piece, and I don't have to worry about them again for ten years. Well, I'll be an old man by then. I got my son-in-law to do it. So, uh, so that's a good, good, happy thing, and a good, uh, good, happy way to start this hour. Um, Let's get to this, and, and I want to I want to uh, play these comments from Mike Loxley. We'll, we'll talk Maryland football here in a minute, but uh, it's pretty much, gentlemen, start your engines now for free agency in baseball, and we may never have had a free agent like this before. Uh, Reggie Jackson in 1977 came to the New York Yankees, who had been swept by the Reds in the World Series. It was a 4-0 sweep, and while free agency had come in the year before, in 1976, and we had a couple of them break the ice, including Andy Messerschmidt, who went from the Dodgers to the Braves. Uh, full free agency really hadn't hadn't worked its way in, and in those days there was only really one team that was going to spend, and that was the Yankees with George Steinbrenner. So he brought Reggie in from the A's, well, actually from the Orioles. The, the A's knew with free agency coming, they weren't going to re-sign Reggie Jackson to a new contract, so they traded him to the Orioles during the 76 season, got what they could, and then Reggie didn't re-sign with Baltimore. He came to New York, and it was it was on. So maybe he was the most high-profile free agent. I don't know. Maybe there have been others since then. Um, 
players who have moved from team to team. Bryce Harper certainly, uh, but he had not won a World Series. He'd won an MVP here, but but went to the uh, went to the Phillies. I mean, it's, it happens. It happens on a regular basis now. But somebody like Shohei Otani, the the interest is is through the roof. And Bob Nightingale of USA Today has a long story on this. I'm going to go through some of the highlights here just to give you an idea of of what this is going to be like. He says the Otani free agent sweepstakes is the epicenter of the Major League Baseball general manager meetings going on at the Omni Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona. An entire industry anxiously awaits the outcome of this. And Nightingale says, traditionally, when a marquee free agent hits the open market, he'll get two, perhaps three legitimate offers. Aaron Judge got offers from the Yankees, the Giants, and the Padres, three teams. Bryce Harper's market consisted of the Phillies, the Dodgers, and the Giants, three teams. Manny Machado had offers only from the Padres and the White Sox. Nightingale says Otani could have as many as 10 teams making legitimate offers and perhaps as many as 20 who will tell their fan base that they're in on him too. Simply put, he's the holy grail of free agency in the sports world. He says there will be big markets and mid-sized markets involved. Teams from San Diego to Toronto to Texas to New York to Chicago – will be in the bidding. The only thing guaranteed, GM say, is there will be a mystery team, a finalist in the sweepstakes that no one saw coming. I can pretty much assure you it won't be the Nationals unless there's some wild transfer of ownership in the next, you know, week or two. But I, I don't see that happening. So, uh, but but the fact that these other big-name free agents are looking at three teams and he's looking at ten, wow. Uh, and Nightingale says, don't rule out the Angels. He says the Angels never reached the postseason during his six years with the team, but he has been the most electrifying player in the game, hitting a league-leading 44 homers with 95 runs batted in, 20 stolen bases, and a career-high 1066 OPS despite missing most of September. On the mound, he went 25-14 and 14 with a 2.69 ERA, striking out 386 batters in 298 innings in the last two years. Where else can you find a legitimate ace and one of the game's premier power hitters in one package? He makes the comparison to, you know, like a great quarterback also being a great safety. I, I don't know if it's that, but it is very intriguing. Um, he says the Angels may be flawed, but they know they're a whole lot better with him than without him and truly believe they have a genuine chance to keep him. If they wanted to trade him last summer, they could have received at least three top ten prospects from any contender. Several teams were willing to offer their best and more. Angels owner Artie Moreno also knew that if he traded Otani, he wasn't getting him back. Once Otani walked out the door, he was gone forever. That, that by the way, those trade offers were before he tore an elbow ligament and is going to need Tommy John surgery. So for all of this two-way player stuff for next year, he's only going to be a designated hitter. We know that. So the first year, he's going to be a DH. And uh, I was thinking about this, too. The, the universal DH, I think, is only two seasons old. So what would have happened three years ago if he would have been in this situation where he's not going to pitch next year and he's only going to be a DH and the National League doesn't have a DH? Would, would National League teams still try to get him? They might, you know, for, for the, the games that they would play at American League parks when you had interleague play, you'd have, uh, you know, a designated hitter. And you would also have the promise of, of getting him back on the mound after his second Tommy John surgery. That You know, that's, that's the one thing about that, too, is that – once you've had two Tommy John surgeries, there's no three. They can't do a third one. So if he comes back from that and he blows it out again, then you're looking at him only as being a DH for the rest of his career. Um, more from the Bob Nightingale story in USA Today. For all those that don't believe Otani has any interest in returning to the Angels, realize they signed Mike Trout to a 10-year, $360 million contract when folks thought he preferred one day to play in Philadelphia or New York. They outbid the Miami Marlins and Reds for Albert Pujols in 2011. They persuaded Anthony Rendon to come their way in 2019. Now, those weren't all good moves, particularly Rendon, who never plays because he's hurt. But he says Artie Moreno, the owner of the team, loves his stars, and he's not shy of the luxury tax, which is going to be about $237 million in 2024. So this will be fun to see what happens. But whoever gets him, you remember for next year, you're not getting an ace pitcher. You're getting a designated hitter. 
a very good designated hitter, maybe a great designated hitter, who hit 44 home runs and can also steal bases. But Otani's not pitching for you next year, and beyond that, who knows? And another thing I would wonder about, um, although he did play several games with the torn elbow ligament, uh, once he has it repaired, uh, how's that going to affect his batting? Uh, could it could it be possible that you know he goes to wh- wherever or goes back to the Angels and and can't hit the way he used to because of the second Tommy John? I don't think so, but but all that would possibly be in play. So there's that. Uh, Maryland getting ready to play at Nebraska on Saturday, and that may be their last chance to make it to a bowl game because the last three are at Nebraska, home against Michigan, and they're going to beat Michigan. And, and then they finish up the season at Rutgers, and Rutgers is already bowl eligible. And they gave, I think they gave a tougher time to Ohio State than Maryland did. True, Maryland had to play them in Columbus. But uh, that, that would be a very tough, tough road if they lo- lose the next two, which would mean a six-game losing streak going into the final game of the season at Rutgers. But uh, yesterday, Mike Loxley held his weekly news conference as they get ready to play Nebraska. They are actually two-point favorites in this game. Two-point favorites against a Nebraska team, which is very good defensively. But uh, one of the questions that Loxley was asked was, you got a four-game losing streak. How do you approach the players? How do you deal with them, given that you went into the season talking about competing for a Big Ten championship, and you win 5-0, and oh, and now you're 5-4, and four, and you're fighting for your lives just to make it to a bowl game. Here's Loxley. It's with open, honest communication. You know, it's one thing to be positive and, and put a smile on your face and show up and say, hey, it's going to eventually turn and be okay. But it's another thing to to understand the reality of where we are. It's been five weeks since we've had a victory. And so I told our players, we got to understand it. We didn't watch the Penn State tape. We didn't play to the best of our ability. But here's the reality of where we are. We're a 5-14. and four team. Uh, We have an opportunity to be bowl eligible three years in a row still. Um, we, we have, you know, the the last quarter of our season or the last third of our season uh, starts with this game. So it's almost like a fresh start. And it's about how you finish, which is one of the paramounts or, or pillars of our program is starting fast and finishing strong. And so, you know, this is like a fresh start for us. The best part about being the coach of this team is, and I said this to them yesterday after practice, there hasn't been one day I've shown up and I've been a part of some teams here where we've had losing streaks the longer than four weeks. And you can tell by the energy on the field that it's going to be a long, long day or a long, long week. This team is not that team. They are built for the adversity. They are built for the turbulence that we're facing. Uh, I can tell you that we're facing it together. We know that the only people that believe in, in us right now is us. And as long as they continue to show up with the right mindset as a coach and as a leader, I'm going to continue to coach the crap out of them, push them. And, 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 and we still have a lot of, a lot of things, good things to play for. And I think they see that and they believe it. Well, he's, he's been very complimentary of this team throughout the season. Uh, but when you put yourself out there at the beginning and say, we think we can compete for a Big Ten championship, you're not going to really moonwalk away, are you? The, the turnovers, big problem. Uh, they had a plus nine during the five-game winning streak to start the season. True, not as good competition, although they've played a couple of stinkers along the way. They should not have lost to Illinois in the homecoming game. They should not have lost at uh, Northwestern, but they have. And during the four-game losing streak, that's reversed to a negative eight. So they've gone from plus nine on turnovers to negative eight. That's a problem. Uh, Running game uh, against Penn State, they had only seven carries for minus six yards. Minus six yards rushing for a game. And against Northwestern, they had only 14 carries. Should have run the ball more, but I guess had fallen so far behind. They had 80 yards rushing, so they got to get that uh, back on track. And they're playing a Nebraska team, which has the same record, five and four, but they have the 22nd best scoring defense in the country, 18.8 points a game, and they're very good against the run. So it's going to be tough, but this might be their best shot to get in as a bowl team this year. And as Lockley says. We ain't quitting. They know that nobody gives us anything here at the University of Maryland. Everything we get, we got to take, we got to earn, we got to fight for. You know, it was great to start out 5-0, and but we also know we're also in the reality of a four-game losing streak. And the only people that are going to get us out of it will be the people in Jones Hill House. And the, we, we ain't quitting. 
quitting is not an option. And that's the part that this team, I love about them, and I'm going to continue to coach the crap out of them. And we'll find a way to get six, which helps us extend our season. And we'll continue the process of developing this team to compete for championships. We ain't quitting. Um, we'll see if he gets a quarterback next year. He's got a, a quarterback who's been on the roster. This is his second year. So uh, when, when Talia finally leaves and he's been there forever, um, we'll see what happens. He's a very good recruiter. I, I think he's a good coach. I think he has done a very good job in difficult cir- circumstances turning this program around after the DJ Durkin uh, tragedy where Jordan McNair died because of negligence of the coaches where they had a, had a drill and he should have been put in a cold tub and, arrangements weren't made and so forth. I, I think he's he's got people feeling pretty good about Maryland football, but this four-game losing streak is uh, is a problem right now. Tiger Woods. You know, they used to say about E.F. Hutton, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. When Tiger Woods talks, people listen. And I don't think he's ever going to be in position to compete for majors again. He's, he's managed to make the cut in a couple of them, including the Masters, but his leg always wears down, you know. He's he's got that 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 all the plates and screws in the leg from the the uh, the terrible broken leg he suffered in that car crash a few years ago. And um, he's saying now, though, he, he did an interview with the Associated Press, and he said, "My ankle is fine. When they fuse my ankle, I have absolutely zero issues whatsoever. The pain is completely gone." And uh, he compared his leg issues to what occurred after his lower back fusion surgery in 2017. He says, uh, no problem with the back, but it's the areas around it. And that's what he's saying about the leg as well. But uh, he says he's going to be playing in the Jupiter Lynx CG, which is a four-man team that will be part of TGL, the Tech Infused Golf League that he co-founded with Rory McIlroy. I guess you're not walking there. And apart from the uh, launch of that in January, he has yet to announce if he will return to competition. Sounds like he's gearing up to play in the Masters again, which is what everybody wants to see. But, you know, he is in his late 40s, and he's had just so many injuries in his career that to think he could get back and be competitive, even in the Masters, which is what suits him best, really amazing. But the, the thing about him is you, you just don't count him out. He's, he's, he's Michael Jordan in golf, and uh, the injuries have certainly played a big factor. But... To think that he's got 15 majors, I mean, he would need four more to pass Jack, and that's not going to happen. But just when you want to say, that's it, you'll never see him back on the golf course again, you just never know. So every time he makes a statement like, my ankle is fine, people's ears perk up like, roo, roo, oh, really, oh, Tiger, Tiger Woods. And, you know, a lot of people are like me with golf. We're Tiger fans. We, we pay much more attention when Tiger plays. The networks know that. They love it when he at least gets out there. And even with golfers who are, you know, much better and in a much better position to win, the fringe fans like me, people who don't play but are intrigued by Tiger, we pay attention to that. So uh, clip and save. We'll see what happens uh, down the road. Deion Sanders talking to Dan Patrick yesterday. Uh, you know, they had that 3-0 and start. Well, now they're 4-5 and five and uh, would need to win two of the last three to be bowl eligible. But you never know. 